Okay, uh, please join me in welcoming Justin to the stage with I Hate Math and All the Fair with Circles. Hi, uh, I'm Justin. Um, I work at Big Bang Entertainment um, up on 16th Street in Glendale. And we also uh, just shipped MX vs. HP Supercross for PS4, so I'm tired. But game's out. Go buy it. Um, I, might, I have two free to give away, and I don't know how I'm going to do that yet. If you guys have ideas on how to make it fair for this crowd to get a free game, we'll talk about that later. So uh, my talk is uh, I Hate Math, A Love Affair with Circles. Um, how many people here adore and love math and use it every day? I mean, I use math. All of the above. It's not pick one. It's it's all inclusive. Yeah. Um, how many people absolutely hate math? All right. And what like so so in the middle? Yeah. All right. Good. So uh, before I start, I want to let you know that if you absolutely love math, I'm going to lie to you because I want to teach math and uh, I have to lie to do that. Um, for everyone that is learning from me, I'm going to tell you too. I'm lying to you. So you're going to get something out of it though. So it's a good lie. <coughs> Why did that not work? All right, we're going cowboy style. <laughs> um, so these are the reasons why I despise math. Um, it's often taught without like a real application in my mind. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of uh, instructors like to teach me math by saying, hey, we're going to do this thing, and now I'm going to give you homework that's the same thing I told you to do in class. And nowhere along the way am I going to help you understand what I just gave you. Just be repetitive, and you'll get it. Um, I personally think math is hard to understand without a visual model. Uh, I'm a visual learner, so that, that's the downfall. Geometry is great for me. Uh, other mathematics that are in you know, imagination land, I can't deal with. Um, I already met this one, the repetitive exercises. And I think it's incredibly hard to make math fun have many people in my life that I'm like, oh yeah, I did this thing today, x plus x, and then boom, they're done. They're out, they shut off. Every word that I say is useless after that. So I think that's our struggle with math and mine, mine personally. But I do love circles a whole bunch. I love circles because we can use them to do things in games like collision. Uh, we can use them to figure out direction. Um, we can derive motion from circles. We can derive color from circles. And circles go forever, just forever and ever. So uh, let's take a minute to appreciate some famous circles. We got crop circles. Uh, not so much anymore, right? Like maybe in the early 90s or something. Um, inner circles, you know. Uh, a perfect circle. I don't, I don't personally listen to them, but they're well liked, I guess. <laughs> Circle of protections, got to have circle of protections. The circle of trust, that's a, that's a steep one. Most important circle of all, <laughs> circle of life. So uh, what makes a circle? I'm going incredibly fast. This is great. Uh, Wikipedia says, it is the set of all points in a plane that are at a given distance from a given point, the center, Equivalently, it is the curve traced out by a point that moves so that its distance from a given point is constant. That's very understandable. Thank you, Wikipedia. So if you need help translating that, blah, 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 point, blah, blah, distance. That's a circle. It's a point and a distance. Some people call the distance a, a radius, I believe. So here I have a point. This line here demonstrates a distance, 109 units of some sort. And uh, there it is. As I make my distance greater, my circle gets bigger. Boom. And that other part about the thing from the origin and being constant, well, this guy's not constant, but kind of. So uh, as you trace it around in a rotation, it creates a circle. So in order to get anywhere with circles, I, I do, unfortunately, um, I have to teach you math. So if you got duped, I'm sorry. So here we go. 
Here's the distance formula. Um, basically, this is awesome, cool, technical things. I found this plugin that lets me do these uh, intense math looking graphs, so I used it. But basically, um, you have a point, you have a point, he has an x and y coordinate, he has an x and y coordinate, and this is just telling us x minus x, so 0.1 minus 0.2x, 0.2 minus 0.1x. Add those together, or square those, add those together, and then if you take the square root, you're left with uh, the distance between those two points. Um, cool part about points and the distance formula and why eventually you're going to have to love this thing if you want to do anything is that uh, nine times out of ten, I can, I can not use the square root. Um, a lot of times I just want to say, is this thing greater than 400 units from me? And if I want to do that, instead I can square the thing I'm checking against. So instead of doing the square root, I can say 400 times 400 versus that part of the distance formula. And uh, I, I made a decision based on distance. I didn't use a square root. Um, I don't know in modern architecture, square root still ass slow. Still relatively expensive. Yeah. Yeah. So notorious, uh, square roots are notorious for just being slow in computer programming, computer algorithms. Um, so people try to avoid them. Um, I think that this is a tip that no one taught me and I was always just squaring away, checking distances all the time. And then when I learned this, I was like, oh, cool. Uh, order is not important when you do distance. So I know a lot of times you're like, okay, I'm gonna do a subtraction here, so do I need them on this side? Do I need them on this side? And personally, I bust out some graph paper, draw it on the thing, put an X, put a Y, make imaginary numbers for them, draw lines and be like, okay, it's good. I can do this math. Um, when you wanna know the distance between two things, just go with whatever one you like better. Put them first. So with all that, I'm double whamming. Now you get code, this is great. Uh, I want to do a distance check. So I made a turret. And this green thing this is at like his activation zone, right? He's happy. He doesn't have a job to do. He's green. Uh, what I wanted to point out here is I've expanded out this guy as the distance formula. Uh, if you were you know, using this over and over, you might make a function so you don't have to type that and be very error prone. Um, also, I did not read these bits of code, so if you find an error, I'll fix it. Um, but what I want to point out here is I have a radius up top, let's call it 100 for now, and I have this px, py, tx, ty, that's player x, player y, turret x, turret y. They're equal to values, in this case, of what's on the screen. Um, so I'm going to get the distance squared, and that's where I said earlier, this is the distance formula, the inner bit without the square root, and then I want to check that radius, so I square, uh, square him, just multiply them together. And then with just these two lines of code here, I know if I am inside the circle or outside the circle. So I think as far as code goes, that's like incredibly small and incredibly powerful. Um, it's a pattern you can use over and over again, all over the place. And if this is working, I got my player and he wanders in and that, that's it. That's all I'm doing is saying if my distance is less than that activation radius, so if my distance from here to here it's less than this value, I'm inside of it. If it's greater than, I'm outside. So you could think uh, triggers in your game when your guy walks into a circle, you want some effect to fire off, sound effect. Um, you could get probably a little crazier with this and, and actually do the subtraction between the distance and the radius and maybe like attenuate sound to some degree. Um, there's all kinds of stuff you can do with this and so far, we're just doing a subtraction or addition and multiplication and two if checks. So I think this is pretty good, but I think we can do better. But I want to stop there. Does anyone have questions about how to determine if you're inside or outside of a circle? We got it. Sweet. I think you're lying, but it's cool. Uh, so this other slide, let's go back here for a minute. Um, I'm literally, like if I get on the edge here, that circle's in there, right? And it doesn't count because I'm dealing with the, the concrete point, right? I'm saying distance from this point to that point. And that's valuable when your objects are small or 
you're checking against an edge of it, or I don't know, there's probably all kinds of reasons why that just knowing a point is inside of a circle is valid. But what I want to know is when is a circle inside of a circle? Um, if you could imagine here, our fancy high-tech turret and our little player guy, uh, you may have a box that's around him or some boxy object. And nine times out of 10 in games, this is actually good enough to have the circle in there and do a collision based on his circle. Um, a lot of times, depending on the gameplay, you can get away with make the circle a little bit bigger to be more, if I'm attacking something, I want the circles a little bit bigger because if the player hits a guy that he didn't really hit, they're usually okay with that. And if I'm making a player object for me, I'm gonna make my circle smaller than my visual representation because again, people don't usually get mad when they feel like they escaped death. So now if it's like obnoxious, people might get mad, but you can fudge it, you can play with it. You can get very far with just using circle collisions to make an entire game. So what we did here is uh, I just built on that last example, and I, I know I just told you to throw the square root away, but I didn't want to because I had to do a little more complicated check. But basically, this is the same distance formula we just had in the other one. These are almost the same if checks. The only thing we're doing extra is we're adding in the radius here, and we're using that and checking against this radius. So after we get the, the distance, I want to square it because I want the actual distance here because I'm actually just going to go and subtract his value. So if this is his distance, right, circle point distance, that's his distance. I want to subtract it from the edge of this. And then that allows me to do a check to say, okay, is any part of this, this distance here, is, any, is, any, is the edge of this guy in there? And with uh, our little check here, now our player has a lot harder time like navigating through this. And it should work on all sides. And that's the thing I wanted to point out. This is why I love circles, is that if we just think of a circle as a point and a distance, 360 degrees, and we're in a 2D plane, we're good. Like I don't have to do, is, is he on the positive Y? Is he on the negative Y? Is he on the positive X? Is he on the negative X? I don't have to worry about any of that stuff because we're always just, every frame, what's the distance? Am I inside of it? What's the distance? Am I inside of it? What's the distance? And that's all accomplished with, again, a pretty small bit of code. Um, my speaker notes aren't working. It's good stuff. Oh, that's uh, so I can show you all of its glory. Wow. All right, so we know how to check if a point is inside a circle. We know how to check if a circle, any point on that circle is inside of a circle, but if a circle is overlapping a circle, if a circle is in a circle, um, with those, those two guys, all we use is we use the distance formula to get the distance between two points, and then we just did a check greater than less than, right? Or greater than equal to less than, whatever. Yeah? Is the reason why you did a square root so that you didn't have a second variable? Uh, the reason I did the square root on this one is because, so if I did my other trick that I had earlier where if I said, let's get the distance squared and not square root it, and then let's get the distance squared of this guy. If I subtract the distance squared from this guy and the distance squared from this guy, if you break that math out, that doesn't, that just doesn't work because this point would already have to be accounted for in that original like double squaring that we did um, of his radius. And I know if I was a better mathematician and teacher, I could draw it out and show you exactly why. But it, it's a problem of, I would, if I did the distance from here to here to begin with, like I'd be golden, that would work, right? I could do the squared thing, I could check my squared radius, but because I'm doing this distance and then saying subtract this distance, because um, the square doesn't multiply, so it's, it's comparing two things that aren't the same, really. Uh, so we, we square root it here to get the distance, and I know that there's a bit of math that I can do to actually, ahead of time, get the, the, get the point here. Uh, yeah, well, the square root is just, when you do the square root, that gives you the actual real distance. Like, that's, if you were, you know, yardsticked it out, it, that's the distance. And when you don't square root it, you know, you're, you're multiplying it by itself, right? So, not, it's not, it's exponent, right, exponential. Um, so, if we take, 
this guy that's been multiplied by himself and he's out here somewhere, which he's probably actually in like infinity land. And we take this guy and we do that too. When I subtract that bit, I'm only subtracting off like a chunk of that big. When really, if I square root this, it's gonna be way bigger than if I square root this. So I can't subtract it after the fact. Um, and when in doubt, just square root it and just deal with the normal distance. That was the, the whole uh, don't square root it thing was just kind of like a pro tip. If your game is obnoxiously slow and you're like, you know what, I'm square, square rooting everything, uh, there might be a chance where you can get away with getting rid of a square root. But with this guy, I just rolled with square root, get the real distance, compare the real distance, just do math on, on the actual uh, values. So, yeah, more math. Uh, so what I wanna get into here is we have like the very beginning of something that might be fun, but I don't think users just wanna like light up a green light in a, in a circle all day. I don't, I don't think people are gonna buy that game. Maybe it's on iPad or something, I don't know. Um, so what I wanna do next is I wanna figure out, you know, in order to have a game, we need direction and we need motion, right? So we're gonna build, we're gonna go forward, and I hope I don't lose anybody. Uh, this stuff looks familiar. Uh, college, at some point, high school, they tried to teach me this stuff. And um, the thing that I really like about this mathematical notation up here is it's like, it's how mathematicians are fancy, you know? Like, you want it to look nice and present well. Um, I think if you know it, it actually reads better. It's like a programming language, right? But this is, pretty, this is pretty basic stuff. And what I see here is this little arrow is saying I'm working with a vector. A vector is, uh, I refer to as a point with intention. Um, a vector can describe a direction. A vector can describe lots of things. I really don't want to get into vector math at all, but I wanted to touch on it because a lot of the stuff I'm gonna show you how to solve can just be done with vector math. We don't need some of the stuff I'm gonna show you. But I love circles so much that I just wanna teach you about circles, so. Um, it's just a point, right? It's just an X and a Y. This guy, he's an X and a Y. This guy, he's an X and a Y. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying if I wanna add these two guys, just add X plus X, Y plus Y, and you're left with the resulting X and Y. So it's, it's just like the distance formula. We're just taking two points, we're adding them together. That's it. Uh, this bit here, I think this is that whole, like you have, to, you have to prove things in math. I got this off the internet. <laughs> but they're like, oh, if you subtract these guys and you add the negative of this guy, they're equal. And that's, that's good to know. But I just want to add them and subtract them. And I believe you. I trust you. You've, you've taught me math. I believe you. So what I want to point out down here is this, this is all I'm saying. To do a vector addition, you have a, a resulting x, x1 plus x2, resulting y, y1 plus y2. Subtraction, same thing. But the only problem is, is there, uh, order matters now when we're doing subtraction, especially if we're trying to find directions. Um, order matters a lot, actually. And you could get yourself upside down. The cool part with doing these types of things when order matters is you almost immediately know because it's upside down or backwards. So you switch it and you're good. And then if we're gonna talk about circles, we have to talk about radians and degrees. Um, honestly, I'll tell you, this is how I handle this problem. I have two variables in my programs. One's called radian to degree. The other one's called degree to radian and I multiply my degree by it to get my resulting radian. I multiply my radian by it to get my resulting degree. And that's what this is telling us here. To get a degree, take a radian, multiply it, 180 divided by pi. Same thing here. Um, what's pi? I think I read that it's, it's a ratio based on the circumference of the circle and its diameter. And that sounds cool, but uh, <laughs> I know that trigonometry loves radians and functions of trigonometry loves radians. Um, so usually I think, in, I think in degrees and then I multiply it by my little magic 
guy that I made, I'm golden. Just stick it inside whatever trig function I know wants radiance. But it is something you're gonna have to be aware of because when you're dealing with different game engines, they just, they're just all over the place with this crap. Like, sometimes they're like, hey, give me a degree. And then you find another function, put in your degree. No, that's not right at all. And you find out, nope, this one takes a radian. So just, just be aware of when you're using some built-in bit, if it takes a radian or a degree, we can convert to and from them. And I can actually show you more to make it sense because like I said, visual learning is, is my thing. And this is, there's no vision here, this is just text. So uh, here's, a, here's a circle. And what I wanted to show you here is we have degrees, we have radians, and this theta guy down here, he actually is just the raw output from a function I'm gonna show you in a little bit. I just wanted to put it there because it'll be really important later. So remember this guy. But for now, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna remap this guy so that degrees make sense. And they're traditionally how they're displayed in like math text and everything else. With, we have a zero right here. And you can see as I move this guy, we're gonna get some numbers flying at you. Uh, we go here, so we go from zero, we got 90 degrees, which is 1.575 radians, which is what? Pi divided by two, I think. Yeah. Good? And then we get over here, we're cruising toward 180, and I think everyone, like when I think 180 degrees in my head, I think behind me, um, like it's, it's easier for me to think in degrees. This, this radiant stuff is nonsense, but it's important, <laughs> super important. Uh, so here we have pi. So that's all I really wanted to show you is that in a circle you start at zero, come up over here, that's pi or 180 degrees. Come down here, back up to here, that's two pi or 360 degrees. And I made all these interactive slides that almost killed me, so we're gonna do this. There we go. Wait, 360. <laughs> and uh, I mentioned on that whole infinite thing about circles, this is going to loop forever. So radians is zero here because radians is 2 pi and 2 pi is zero. So that's what's going on. 2 pi is zero. No, when, uh, when you're going in circles, once, once you cross that 2 pi threshold, it, you can wrap back around at zero. So you can actually, you can think of it in just, to, just keep adding to the number and it'll keep rotating, right? Forever. But if you want to clamp it or do something else, you can, you can say, okay, I'm at close to two pi. I actually want to reset to zero because it's easier for me to think in smaller numbers instead of counting like 80 multiples of a rotation and then trying to get back to something sane. Um, but yeah, they just keep going. They don't stop. I love this graph because the slide that I wanted to make for this was like the furthest from this thing. Like I can't even, I don't even know what's happening here. I'm tired, man. Um, but there's this cool function called ATAN2. And I know they're trying to explain to me exactly what it does in this graph. <laughs> but what I do absolutely know about ATAN2 is it's a great way for me to give it an X and a Y and it'll give me back an angle. And that's what I really care about. Um, there's a couple tricks. Like this, this guy here assumes to be zero nine times out of 10. And then when you give it an X and a Y that's over here, it's gonna come back and be like, oh yeah, look at, you're at, you're at zero. So then that, that other thing where I showed you the circle likes to go from 360, or from zero to 180 and back. ATN2, he, he, he has different rules. And he likes to go from zero to negative 180. And then as soon as you cross that threshold, it goes from 180 back to zero. Yeah, 180 back to zero. So um, a lot of times what you can do is you can, you can add 720 degrees to it and not worry about zeros and stuff and just live out in this magic space where I can divide by 360 and think it goes forever. Um, or you can also not worry about it at all because any angle that I get out of ATAN2, when I plug it back into these guys, it just does what I want it to. Um, I don't have to worry about what degree exactly it is. 
But if I want to know what degree exactly it is, I have a little bit of code where I usually, I think I uh, take 360 degrees, subtract ATAN 2 plus 720 mod 360. Um, it's going to be cool that these slides are online. And every one of these slides that I have is JavaScript. And all the stuff's there. And you're going to see it. And you're going to play with it. And you can download it. And you can, you can modify any of these slides. And I think this guy's good because I really want to um, show you how to use sine and cosine to do things. We talked about motion. Um, we talked about direction. We can, we can really use these guys. And what I like about this GIF which I think I cribbed from Wikipedia. If you click it, it'll go there. Um, is what they're showing you here is you have a, deg a degree, right? You have these radians between you know, 0 and 2 pi. As this thing goes in and you plug it in, sin takes one variable. It takes an angle, or uh, it's going to be referred to as theta when you're reading other texts, trying to map whatever I'm telling you back. Um, when you plug it in, sine is this. This is the value that you're getting out. What this is trying to show you, there's a real faint line there that's really hard to see, is that as your angle goes around the circle, sine is just the y-axis of that point on the circle. So as this guy spins around, and I'm drawing it in, a, in an axis here, I'm saying here's negative 1. Oh, shit, I forgot. This is the unit circle. Unit circle. Um, <laughs> all that means is that the center point is 0, basically, and it goes from 1, negative 1, positive 1, negative 1 in all directions. And that's really important because anything that comes out of this we know is always between 0 and 1. So we can multiply to our heart's content and make it between 0 and 500, 0 and 1,000, 0 and a million. And we can tightly control what we want to do. But what I just want to show is that as this angle increases, this little imaginary dot goes around the circle. And you're just getting you know, from negative y, and then slowly you're going down here. That's positive y. What am I doing? Negative y, positive y, negative y. Cosine, he cares about the x. So uh, when I get confused, I come back to this guy and just watch it for a while. And I'm like, oh, I got it. The x is what's happening. Here's this dot. He's going back and forth on the x. This guy's going back and forth on the y. And this original talk was going to be how to use sine and cosine to do everything. and. Uh, I don't know if I made it worse by stepping back or better, but we, we had to get rid of that. So I, I think that out of anything I'm going to teach you, investigate this more. Um, there's applications for motion. There's applications for color. There's applications for all kinds of things. When you want to pulse things, when you want guys to animate and you just don't want them like going and stopping and sitting there, they, it adds curves to your motion. It's cool stuff. And I feel like I said so many things that I almost forgot what the whole point of all that was. So what I want to do is I know that I can take here. My guy's hiding. Go to there. I can get a distance. I can determine if he's inside or outside. What I really want to know is once I know where he's at, I want an angle to him. You know, I want to know eventually how to shoot things at him, right? And this is where vector math, could, you could just do it. You could just open up your, your algebra textbook and do some vector math and be done. But I don't think that's fun. And this might be terribly inefficient, but it's fun. So uh, ATAN2, we have player x, turret x, player x, turret x, player y, turret y. I have to do that whole subtraction thing. Because what I want to do is I want a point that's relative to the turret. Because when I come to this ATAN2, he expects his point you know, to be somewhere, assuming this is center, he expects his point to be somewhere like around him. right? You're going to get really strange results if you just throw random x and y's in there. Um, it's going to be weird. So I take the player, subtract this out, and that's giving me a point relative to the location I care about. Um, kind of pretending that like this is our new zero in the world, right? Like we're going to base everything around this point from here on out. That's why I just subtracted them. Then I plug it in ATAN2. He takes Y first. 
And I think that's really important when you're dealing with tangents and arc tangents and all that good stuff. But he takes y first. Don't put in x and y, you won't get the right result. Put in y and x. And I put those in, that gives me an angle. And that's going to be an angle like I talked about with the 0, negative 180, blah. But the cool part is, the only reason I want that angle is because I hate slopes and I hate that whole slope thing that they taught me. So if I plug in the angle to cosine, cosine cares about x, like we saw in that graph. Plug in that angle to sine, sine cares about y. That just gave me the point on the edge, but you know, between 0 and 1. So now with that, I have the angle that I'm looking for in x and y coordinates, right? And going back to more vector math, if I take my x and my y, I multiply it by 5 because I want this thing to travel 5 units. I probably should do 5 times delta time and like make it 5 units per second, but this is just 5 hardcore units. And then uh, add it to the position of the bullet, then every, every frame it's going to, you know, plus 5, 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 plus whatever. You know, whatever the angle is, it's going to be scaled by these guys. So that's it. It's going to send the bullet out on its angle. Let's see if I'm, if I'm right here. Bam! Got him. So I used the previous slide that we built up to show you how to get this circle inside this other circle. And then I run that subtraction through. Gives me the angle. Once I have the angle, put it in a cosine and sine because cosine cares about x, sine cares about y. And I just send them sailing. And now I have bullets. And I have radial. Follow me wherever I go, bullets. Um, and we're good. And I think the reason why I personally like a tan 2 cosine sine is that uh, I don't have to think about is he on the left, is he on the right, is he there, is he there. I do this little get it relative to the point I care about and then everything else is handled for me and I'm good to go. And that might be playing with fire that I don't understand this stuff like deeply. <laughs> but um, I made a lot of games that have shipped and worked just fine. So it's working. What's up? Yes, because I want to show you arctan2 because it's my favorite uh, trig function ever. Um, I have all. This is what I know. Here's what I know. So tangent. I don't know what that does. And the only reason I know why arctan2 exists is because a lot of times people. Uh, like to solve this problem of how do I get an angle relative to a point an entirely different way, and it almost always breaks, um, like uh, dot products in vector math, right? As you approach this certain point, the dot product's no good, and it flips at 90, and it flips at 90, and it flips, and now you have all these edge cases of, well, am I on the left? Am I on the right? Am I up? Am I down? Where, like, where the hell am I? What angle do I have? Arctan 2 is like impervious to that and it's continuous. You'll, get, you'll always get a perfectly smooth motion out of arctan 2. There won't ever be a hitch between going from negative 90, flipping over the boundary. Like it's just always perfectly smooth. So uh, I do a lot of UI stuff on our project. And um, anytime I have a scenario where I know I need a very smooth continuous rotation, I just grab ATAN 2 out of my bag of tricks and it, it helps me out. Um, but I can't answer any lower than that, unfortunately. So this is where I want to show you sine and cosine. Um, we're getting weird here. And these guys, they got thrown in kind of last second. But I wanted to take that same thing we just had and augment a little bit, because let's go back. Yeah, this is what I was afraid was going to happen. Uh, this guy is like really horrible at hitting me. Just, I run circles around him all day. And so uh, if I can't increase his accuracy, what I can do is just make him shoot and crazier. Just make him shoot crazier. Uh, so I wanted to take that previous guy and say this is, this is almost all the same bits, right? We have we have the point we're getting a point relative to the turret, calculate the angle. Calculate the direction, send a bullet sailing. Point relative to a turret, calculate the angle, send the bullet sailing. The only thing that's different is this guy. So what I want to do 
is sine, it has that motion that we saw on the graph, that nice, like, smooth, continuous motion. So what I'm thinking is I can use a sine wave to get a motion, and then I can add that in so wherever he points, he kind of shoots in this, like, kind of spray effect. Um, and this is where, like, all those slides on sine and cosine would have been so awesome because I'm just, like, running and gunning now. So sine, he takes that theta, but, like, obviously this is not theta. I'm, what, what am I doing here? So what, what I want to do is uh, this time, this BT, it's going to take the delta time, like, in your tick, in your update loop. Uh, what that means is that every frame, this value is going to increase by the number of seconds that just passed. And I just want to accumulate that into this variable. Touching back on circles are infinite. I can do that because if I just put BT in here into sine, when it got to the end of the circle, it just keeps going. Just, it'll just keep going and it'll mostly work. There's other computer architecture things that are going to like rob you and you're going to hit them and you're going to be like, dude, Justin's a liar. But I told you I was a liar, so we're good. But no, uh, you're going to run into floating point math problems eventually if you send that guy sailing for a really long time. Um, that's something that I think another talk might address. So let's just assume that this is good. We'll take the time and I might have this a bit wrong, but it visually works. Uh, multiplying it by math.pi times two, and that's because one loop around the circle is two pi, and I want to parameterize that, or I just want to scale it, right? I want one loop around the circle to be based on this time value. I don't want one loop around the circle to be, you know, two times 3.14 something. Um, I have a little tool that I use when I'm messing with sines and cosines I'm going to show you at the end. Because uh, I visually, I have to see it. So what I like to do is I like to plug these things into a graph and see what it looks like and then change them. And then that helps build the connection of I'm scaling it this way, I'm scaling it that way, I'm doing all kinds of good stuff. And then over here, the output of sine, that first bit, a uh, number between um, 1 and negative 1. So I want to take 10 degrees. There's that guy. I, I never showed the code to that guy, huh? He's just been like sneaking in. Uh, yeah, I can show you the code to that guy. But I, have t I, wanna, I wanna basically say, take this sine wave and it goes from zero to one like this. I want it to be a degree. I wanna multiply that. I want it to go from negative 10 degrees to positive 10 degrees. So that's what that's getting me. Same, same. And then now, I think he has a better chance of hitting me, just because he doesn't care. But you can see, like immediately when you see it, like that's that sine wave, right? That's, that's that motion that we saw in that GIF. And that's what I like about using sine and cosine. If you're like super obvious with it like this, like you know, well, you might know now, like that's a sine wave. But um, you can map those values to other things you care about. You can map them to alpha. And now you can have an alpha that pulses. You can map them to color, um, change colors of things. You can map it to velocities, speeds, make your guys go, you know, speed up, slow down. It's a lot of cool stuff. But here, I wanted to give this a better chance of hitting them. So that's what I went for. And then color, rainbows. We did it. We're done. I'm going home. Um, so what I want to show you, I think I got another guy. Hold on. Yeah, he's there. All right, so what I want to show you <laughs> is that I used that same idea before of taking this value that increases forever, multiplying it by pi times 2, and then doing this uh, times 180, 180 degrees. Um, and like I said before, game engines, they like, to, they like to lie to us. And sometimes we get a function like uh, a hue. HSV, hue saturation value. And it'll be like, hey, I want degrees because nine times out of 10 an artist is using me and they hate radians. So as a programmer, you're like, okay, it's degree time. Um, but this is why it's important. Because in color, we got a wheel. And it goes from zero to 360, right? So this bullet, when I first started him, he's this, he's this cyan color right here. And this is not the right wheel. I actually wanted a hue saturation value. I think this is luminance or lightness or something, to where as it approaches the edge, it gets wider. And like 50% is in the middle. 
I don't know why you want this, but I don't. But 180 degrees, this is where I started. So this function here is, is doing this 180. I multiply a number between negative 1 and positive 1 by 180. Now I have negative 180, positive 180. So what actually happens with the bullet is this, this guy here travels back using the sign, travels forward using the sign, travels back using the sign. And the faster this is, the, the more I increase this variable, the faster he does it. So I'm able to make Skittles fly at you um, just by taking my base color, plugging it into this, this color wheel, and just shifting the color. So now, uh, yeah, it's probably like picking one here and one here or something. Because this value that's going into here right now is not um, purely delta. So what's happening is the game is running at sub 60 frames per second on this browser in this setup. And so it's stepping. It's not perfect, right? A amount of time passed. So if I only have 30 times to do it, you know, it's going to be like this color, 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 this color. So I'm pretty sure that's why there's two. And he's kind of like, it's like a red, a orange, and then a magenta. So it is a little different. It's kind of um, But I didn't have enough time to really do more about color. But when you get into color, a lot of times when you're programming, uh, you're going to be dealing with red, green, blue. And that's what, that's what everything takes. It takes a red, takes a green, takes a blue. And I think it's a lot more fun a lot of times to think of color as an angle, as a rotation. Because you get these nice, predictable color shifts that aren't like as canned as just saying, ramp the red, ramp the blue. And then you get this weird, you get this weird thing that happens on the screen. And it's because of the way we're mapping colors to a different representation. And if you know how to use sine, you know how to use cosine, you know how to use ATN2, and we're comfortable with now getting angles out of things. Um, your game engine of choice, or the library I used here called Paper.js, it just lets me have a function called hue, and I just shift the hue, and it's cool. And I think in, like in Photoshop, you got the hue slider, right? It just changes the colors. Um, I just like Skittles, so. And the last bit I want to touch on, which I, I managed to pull into the whole entire thing, is this infinite property. Um, I'm doing everything I was doing before, but instead of checking, I'm just saying always fire. And then I just keep adding a value to the rotation. And if we sit here, it's just going to keep spinning. And I'm not, I'm not ever saying, are you greater than 360? Are you less than 360? Are you greater than this? Reset you to zero. Add this thing back. I'm not doing any of that. And if I sat here long enough, weird crap would start going down because of floating point. But, not, but most of the time, like effects-based stuff, it's off the screen before you hit that magic upper limit, right? So you can get away with this all the time. And then when you get bug reports, don't blame me. But they're infinite. They just keep going. And these guys, they crashed my computer earlier. So JavaScript crashed my computer. It's good stuff. Uh, I'm just taking squares and rotating them like 15 degrees and then rotating all the squares and changing their color with hue. And this thing just looks cool. I don't know. That's it. Just, there's a circle in it, right? It makes the negative space as a circle. But just because I rotate it around a center point, it changes color. Whoa, that was fast. Um, and then again, these are my favorite guys. These are sine waves. And they'll just forever wave. And then the things that I wanted to talk about here is uh, links, good links. So this book right here, this real-time collision detection, uh, it's not an easy read. It's insane. It's intense. But it has like everything you'd ever want to do with any, anything to do with collision in games is in here. Um, I think a lot of times people don't care because we're just using Box 2D or we're just using, I don't know, one of the many collision engines out there. And we don't want to think about this stuff. But there's so many times when I'm just like, how do I find if this point has passed this line? Like, that's all I care about. I don't, want, I don't need to set up a collision volume and just be like, oh, hit test, boom. Like, that's obnoxious. Sometimes I'm doing it in 2D space in a UI. 
I don't have those luxuries. They would kill us if we put physics engine in our UI. That's not, that's not gonna happen. Um, so it's important to know these things, right? You need to know when a point passes a line, when a point's inside a square, when it's inside a circle. Or you can just cheat the whole way and use only circles for everything, which is what I do like 90% of the time. Um, so this link just takes you to a link to this guy's book. I love this book. I don't understand it. Love it. Uh, Wolfram Alpha. Have you guys been to Wolfram Alpha? Anyone? Like, you type something in and it reads your mind and shows you like <laughs> everything you ever wanted to know about it and then now it asks you to pay for it. But before it didn't. But it's, it's freaking cool, dude. You put in ATAN2, it's gonna show you like 80 different representations of what that is and what it means and what people said about it when they invented it back in time. Um, it's, it's just this crazy resource. Just check it out. Just go there, type something into it, let it do its thing. This is the one I want to tell you with the sine waves. I use this foo plot. There might be better guys out there, but I don't know. I picked this guy up and I use them. This is going to work. Yeah. So all I wanted to show you here is I just do, I got a sine wave. This is doing stuff. Um, I use this all the time because what usually when I'm doing user interfaces, I'm like, all right, I have an alpha value that goes between zero and one, and I want to make it pulse over five seconds. So what I'll do, this is time, x, is I'll say, come to the site, sine of x. Then I'll start playing with the thing inside the bracket until this line crosses zero, and this line crosses five. Then I'll probably divide the number down, so instead of going from, you know, negative one, positive one, or whatever. You know, I multiplied it there. I'll get it in the range that I want. And now over time, I just have this nice loop, and it just looks good. You put a mouse over something, and if it whoosh, and you put a mouse out, it's a real easy way to get like some dynamic motion in your UI, or your game, or whatever you're working on. And uh, all you need to know is go to Fooplot, type in sign, put in the X, start typing numbers, and just see what happens. I think that's the best way for me to learn what the outputs of the function are gonna be. Um, you could also go pick up math books and they'll explain this whole sign as a right angle with an angle thingy and you can learn it that way too. I'd just rather do this. How do I get back? Command back arrow or left arrow. Well, it's over anyway. That was it. Last one I was going to show you is uh, paper.js is the library that I use. Uh, you just type in paper.js. <laughs> And it's a, cool, it's a cool little library to mess around with, like rendering lines and circles and stuff in JavaScript. Um, all on their website, all their demos are interactive. So if you find a bit of code and it shows you how to do something, you can click edit, you can type a change, you can hit run, and right there in your browser without downloading and installing anything, you're making like interactive little demos with motion and circles and all that good stuff. So I think I went a little over, but any questions? Uh, so we just shipped MX vs. ATV. If you have a PS4 or if you just want a potential free copy of the game, let's do this. You any ideas, Marcus? Um, Who can draw the best circle? <laughs> <laughs> I might take a while. Most important, so. <laughs> no, I, I guess unless we've got like a scrap paper and everybody. Just uh, do some kind of Okay. Yeah, we'll figure out we'll figure out a way to give these away. If you want to be considered for getting a copy, come to me. Maybe we'll put scraps on paper, put it in a hat or something like that. I was gonna ask you questions, but I can't think of any questions that are just like, yo, yeah, you win. That's the right answer. <laughs> yeah, circle. <laughs> On foo plot? Yeah. Just like make that couple of things we're talking about. Okay. All right. Uh, how many seconds? Five seconds. All right, let's see if I'm on my A game right now. 
Uh, let's see. Do I have too many prints? Does it have a concept for pi? Uh, I don't think it does. Oh, what happened, dude? I got too many prints. No, that's the wrong way. I made it smaller. Ah, oh, shit. Ah, <laughs> oh, double shit. Try like next time. Quite oh, we just did two divisions. We could probably do this in multiplications, but we got you. Five seconds. Zero. Five. And between zero and five, I start at zero. I go to one. I come back down. If this was my alpha, this guy would start out invisible and whoop, fully visible up here around two and a half seconds, or probably exactly two and a half seconds. And then back down, boom. And he's maybe not quite on five, but that's cool. No one will notice. <laughs> um, yeah, just, just come in here, plug in numbers, make sine waves that do stuff for you. Uh, I do this a lot on a previous Wii title we worked on. There's this like Mac bar, you know, on the Mac, the little dock does that like growing, shrinking thing when you mouse over it. Can I show you that? Come on. Yeah, this thing. So like we really wanted to have this, this effect in our game. And what I realized is like, dude, that's, that's a fucking sine wave. <laughs> what? So then I went into my math thingy here and plugged in numbers like an idiot until I got something that looked good. And then I applied it to the scale of all the objects. And then as you roll, it just follows the wave. And it was really, it was cool. But yeah, there's all kinds of applications to make neat stuff. The other one I think is really interesting is we have a, we have a search screens in our game. And all they do is pop up, change the screen, this obnoxious red, and tell you something's broken. Um, and then the game stops, and you can't continue it until you get past it. Uh, I hate those assert screens. They're this really ugly red color. And in the heat of shipping, I thought, well, the best way to spend my time than to make those assert screens breathe. I want them to go red, gray. And it's very calming. And it's just like there's a war, there's, there's shit's on fire, but breathe, right? And so that's the cool part about a sine wave is in its natural state, it's like a breath-like motion, right? It's very just, and when you apply it pulses like that, it looks very natural. And I, I learned this on, a, on an Apple computer. When you close it to sleep, the light that blinks, it breathes. It uses a sine wave, and it breathes, and it's supposed to mimic human breath. And there's all kinds of weird like things attached to it. That everything's cool. He's just sleeping, right? Um, but yeah, you can like evoke emotion with this very just breath-like pattern of a sine wave. So, anybody else? All right. I'll give away games. Thanks, guys. <laughs>